present, please rise. Please be seated. <clears throat> morning in the case of State of West Virginia versus Rachel Schoeff's defendant. It is case number 13F88. Uh, this matter is set for sentencing. The record will reflect the presence of the State of West Virginia by Marsha Ashdown, prosecuting attorney, Harry to Christopher, assistant prosecuting attorney, like the presence of the defendant, Rachel Schoeff, in person, and by counsel John Angotti and David Stratus. Are the parties ready to proceed, Ms. Ashdown? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Angotti. Yes, sir. Thank you. Prior to the hearing, the court has received and reviewed various documents, which I will outline at this time. First, I have received and reviewed a pre-sentence investigation report submitted June 13, 2013, uh, by the probation office. Uh, Ms. Ashdown, have you received a copy of the pre-sentence investigation report and had an opportunity to review it? Yes, sir. Mr. Angotti, have you also received a copy of the pre-sentence investigation report and had an opportunity to review it with Ms. Shove? Your Honor, we have, and we've also provided it to the family. Thank you. Uh, in the process of reviewing that, did you find anything that needed to be corrected or otherwise modified? There's no additions, deletions, or corrections. That report then will be accepted as submitted. Uh, the court has also received, pursuant to the order entered at the plea hearing, a comprehensive diagnostic evaluation provided by Youth Services System, Inc. and received on December 19, 2013. Uh, Ms. Ashdown, have you received a copy of that report and had an opportunity to review it? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Angotti, have you also received a copy of that report and had an opportunity to review it with Ms. Shep? Yes, Your Honor. In addition, I have received and reviewed a call here. It would be another or a different psychological report prepared and submitted by Patricia M. Bailey, uh, PhD, uh, reflecting the results of her evaluation of the defendant Rachel Shove. I believe I received that yesterday, February 25. Ms. Ashdown, have you received a copy of that report and had an opportunity to review it? Yes, Mr. Angotti provided that to us, Your Honor. Very well. Mr. Angotti, I assume you have received a copy of that report since you provided it to me. That is correct, Your Honor. Okay. In addition, I have received um, from counsel for the defendant uh, the following letters. Um, I'm going to start with the last one received. I received one yesterday from a Dr. Mark Ellis. On February 20, 2014, I received letters from Lauren Dean, Kelly Dando Kearns, Gregory A. Kittredge, Richard Kyer, Betsy S. Yatiskel, Arthur and Sylvia Morris, Jody K. Everhard, uh, I believe it's Jamie C. Shushler, uh, Patricia and Rusty Schoff, and Mark S. Thrash. Those are what I would consider character references for the defendant, Rachel Schoff. I have reviewed each of those letters. Ms. Ashdown, have you also received copies of those letters? I have received them and read them. Very well. And Mr. Angotti, you submitted them, so I assume you've also received them and read them. That is correct, Your Honor. Uh, for what it's worth, and actually not much in the eyes of the court, I did receive yesterday the report of an incident report. I guess an incident report from an incident that occurred on February 22nd 
at the juvenile facility where Ms. Shope is currently residing. I believe Ms. Ashdown, a copy of that was provided to you. Correct, Your Honor. And uh, Mr. Angotti, I think I sent you a copy also yesterday. You did, correct? Your Honor. We, we received it and provided a copy to Rachel. Sure. All right, I believe that reflects everything that the court has received since the plea hearing and today. Your Honor, may, may we approach the bench for one? Yes, sir. Not as you wish. Anything that you wish to offer by way of testimony, proffer, or statement before sentencing in this matter? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. uh, Rachel would like to speak to the court first, and then I would like to follow up after she's finished with her statement. Okay, very well. Ms. Schoff, I would advise you at this time of your right to allocution. Simply stated, that is your right to make any statement that you may wish the court to consider before it passes sentence in this matter. Uh, you may speak at this time. You can remain seated if you want. Oh, well, I guess you're not on a rolling chair, so I'd say fine. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. I don't know if there's a proper way to make this apology because there are not even words to describe the guilt and remorse that I feel each day for what I've done. The person that did that was not the real me, not the person I am, not what I'm made of and not what I believe in. I don't think I ever thought this would actually happen. I became scared and caught up in something that I did not want to do. I never realized the gravity of my actions and how many people I've hurt. I hurt the niece family and those who love Skylar. I hurt my parents and shamed my family. I hurt my extended family and all of my friends who loved me. I hurt my teachers and those who believed in me. I hurt my church family, my community, and those who trusted me. And I hurt my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May God bring eternal peace to Skylar and the entire Nice family. Again, I'm so sorry, and I pray each day for everyone involved, and I pray each day for forgiveness. Yes, sir. <clears throat> well, Your Honor, there's nothing that I can say here today that would take away the pain and the heartache that the Nice family has and will endure. I further wish in no way to offend the Nice family by my statements here today, nor will I attempt to excuse or minimize the actions of Rachel Schoff that took the, the life of Skylar Nice. The one thing I can say to this court and to the community is Rachel has accepted full and complete responsibility for her actions and expressed sincere remorse for what she has done. It is my belief, knowing the facts as I do, that this case would not have been resolved without the confession and cooperation of Rachel. Her confession, cooperation with the state and federal authorities has brought closure to this tragedy. Further, it's my belief that Sheila Eddy would not have pled guilty to first degree murder without the confession of Rachel Schoff and it would have caused the Nice family to endure a painful trial. 
As the court's aware, pursuant to the plea agreement under paragraph 4, it's anticipated that the state is going to request a sentence of 20 years of incarceration for Rachel Schiff. However, also in the plea, it was anticipated that we would ask this court to sentence Rachel as a juvenile pursuant to West Virginia Code. And we're making that request. Further, it's my understanding of the law that because Rachel is currently only 17 years of age, that she remain in the juvenile detention facility until she attains the age of 18. And then pursuant to state law, she would be returned to this court for the purpose of a reconsideration and or modification of any sentence that this court may impose. We are requesting that ultimately, whether it's today or in a future hearing, that she be sentenced as a juvenile and allow her to remain in the juvenile detention facility until she attains the age of 21 years of age. As the court previously stated, the family has retained Dr. Patricia Bailey to perform an evaluation and an exam and actually to treat Rachel because of these unfortunate circumstances. Dr. Bailey and her recommendation concurs that Rachel has accepted full and complete responsibility for her actions and has expressed genuine remorse and empathy for the niece family. Dr. Bailey's recommendations are as follows, that Rachel remain at the Northern Regional Juvenile Detention Facility until the age of 21. That she continue with her treatment, her psychological treatment, while at the facility in Wheeling. Further, given that Rachel provided testimony and agreed to testify against Sheila Eddy, that it's her opinion that it would be detrimental to place Rachel Schoaf in a detention facility or prison with Sheila Eddy. We're asking that you accept Dr. Bailey's recommendations. We stand here today because Rachel understands and accepts that she should be punished for her actions. But I believe more importantly, she hopes and prays for forgiveness from the niece family, her family, and the community at large. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Ashdown. Your Honor, there are family members who wish to address the court on the subject of victim impact information. There are, I think, two people. David Neese, Skyler's father, will speak. And his brother will speak as well. I'm sure the court will entertain the close relatives who wish to speak. Am I correct, Your Honor? That's correct. Whoever wants to come forward first, we can do so. And as they're coming forward, I just want to note from my standpoint for the record, I've not received written victim impact statements. It's my understanding that none have been submitted. I just want to make sure that that is correct. I take that back. I take that back. I did receive, actually it's in the files. I didn't see it before I looked at the file yesterday. I received victim impact documentation for restitution that Ms. Ashdown submitted on February the 5th. I have received and reviewed that, and we'll talk about that after we've taken the victim impact statements. But as far as receiving a separate written victim impact statement, I have not, and I just wanted to make sure that that's correct. That is correct, Your Honor. Our people have just decided that they would address the court openly in this hearing. That's fine. That's all right. Is that right? Mr. Nace. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, Rachel Shoaff did tell us where Skyler was. Yes, Rachel Shoaff did cooperate. And Rachel Shoaff also murdered my daughter in cold blood. 
Skyler would not be where she was if it wasn't for Rachel. So you said yourself, Your Honor, this is first degree murder. She should not give any leniency and she can take her apologies and everything else and sit on them because that's about what they're worth to me and my wife. She has done nothing but make our lives a living hell since this day one. She did cooperate in the end because she knew that it was closing in on her and yes, she would be caught. That's the only reason she feels remorse. Your Honor, I ask you to give her 40 years and plus if you can. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And, and I'm sorry, just so the record is clear, I can't remember if Mr. Neese identified himself, but that was David Neese, the father of the victim. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, if you would introduce yourself, please. I am Skyler's father, yes. Yes, sir. I'm Carol Michaud, and I'm Skyler's aunt and her mother's sister. And still to this day, we do not know why they did this. And that is a question we would like an answer to. Because what in the world would be so bad that you would have to kill Skyler and to put her through what you did? You didn't think about that when you were doing it, so why would you, we need to think about what, how you feel now. You stood there for over a year, comforting, being with us, telling us you knew nothing. When the police and everybody was coming close, then you decided to confess. You need to think about everything you put us, your family, and everyone else through with not being able to have the pleasures that other kids would have. No grandchildren, no marriages, no prom, no graduation. How do you think that would make us feel? You, you don't get it and neither does Skyler, but at least your parents get to see your face, get to talk to you and see you. We don't even get that luxury. They get to say goodbye to you. We never got to say goodbye or anything. And I hope that you really and truly regret for what you did, but it would never make us feel any better. Um, my name's uh, Michael Meese. I'm Skyler's uncle. Yes, sir. I worked on this for a long time. Kind of a therapeutic thing for myself. I picked up things along the way. Uh, and excuse the uh, less of emotionality if I... I may be over the top at some times and uh, I want to apologize ahead of time. First day, this all started when wife called me at work and told me that Skylar was reported missing. Immediately, I made 200 flyers and drove over to my brother's home and asked him if he heard anything. Just complete silence from him. Seeing my brother so beside himself made me sick to my stomach. He walks me into her room, shows me where she climbed out of the window that night. I noticed right away her clothes she was wearing to work were folded. Neatly on her bed, the cell phone charger was still left plugged in. where she left it three days before. The room was very clean and the bed was made. So I started asking questions. Did she have a boyfriend? Was she having problems at home or work? She had no problems, he said. She took upon herself to get a job and seemed kind of proud of it. Mary just comes home and introduces me to someone and says, this is Skylar's uncle and he loves her very much. I told her, I heard Brian on the radio and I lost it. I leave there and I drive on to 705 and I go to the new Kroger 
with flyers in hand, I started passing them around of people walking out of the store. And I couldn't understand why no one would take any flyers from me. So I began to start putting them on car windshields in the parking lot. Then I saw a man step out of his car and he asked me if I needed help. I looked at the car windshield reflection and my face was blood red and tears rolling down my face. I saw an older couple near their car, so I walked over to them and handed them a flyer. And the man says, we're from out of town. I just broke down, walked to my car, and went home. I couldn't sleep for three days. Later that same week, my brother calls me. They had me pick up some flyers for him at a print shop close to where I live. So my wife and I did this. We got there, and of course, no news. And Mary and Brain looked like they haven't slept for days. While at their home, a police officer stops by to speak to my brother. And at first, I thought, okay, this is it. We finally got some news. But he asked my brother for some flyers that I just brought in for his usage. The officer stated that Skyler was just full of herself and should be home soon. I was furious when you know from every ounce of your being she didn't run away. The helplessness I felt was tremendous. My wife and I head home a few minutes after the police officer leaves. He's standing in front of a bar in Star City holding up a flyer to a woman. There. This is a total nightmare. Months have passed. No words from police. Conversations through Facebook have brought nothing but finger pointing to our family. And no one knows other than their own conspiracy theories of what happened to my niece other than the defendant sitting here today. I know my stress level reached peak on certain days because I drove home from work four times and couldn't remember how I got there. My wife and I drove all over posting flyers and hurry businesses in some cases. We were turned away because it wasn't in our policy for us to put anything related to this type of thing if you believe that. <coughs> a month has passed. Rumors about a party in Blacksville was mentioned, so I stopped by my brother's home and let him know we were heading that way. When I got to the area of the high school, we stopped by a gas station and posted his flyers. We saw some kids and started asking them about a party. One guy said he knew Skyler from Facebook, and the other one didn't want to talk to me. He drove out and eyeballed me the whole time. Well, we posted the flyer in the store and we headed home. News broke out about a body being found five months later in and around where we were, close to. My wife said to me, I wish we would have driven further instead of going home that day, all the time during Skyler's disappearance. While in the car, my wife tells me to look for Skyler because she could be walking on the side of the road or sidewalk. And to this day, Your Honor, I'm still looking. I went to a candle birthday vigil in February to celebrate Skylar's birthday, all along, all along fearing the body found in PA was hers. My brother goes down to Charleston, West Virginia, to promote Skylar Nice Law, knowing full well that body found was his daughter. My depression hit bottom when I noticed the flyers around town were being taken down and a realization my niece was never coming home. Vertigo has ruled over me in nine months to the point where I can't drive and all I seem to want to do is vomit. I can't watch the news anymore. 
because I'm afraid I might see my brother pleading for information on his daughter. Uh, May 25th, 2013, I went to the murder site for the first time. My thoughts were simple, disgusted, raged, and anxious. My brother again stepped up to take homage where his daughter was found, but I can't. Too many variables for me to process because that is where Skylar fought for her life and lost. I'm still trying to make sense of this, and I can't. While at the site, I watched people show up, and I really didn't talk to anyone, and the silence was dismal. I saw Mary and, my, Mary and my brother going down to the log lying on the ground. I assume that's where Skylar was found. I can hear sniffles from both of them, and again, so quiet. I saw branches piled up next to a tree and assume that's where the, the by, were found there and put there by the FBI, and of course I couldn't stop focusing on them. Mary said, speaking to Skylar, I told you about sneaking out. And my brother replied, You see where that got you? So sad. Someone passes a shovel down the hill where my brother tried to dig a hole and plant some flowers for his daughter. With every hit of the shovel hitting the ground, I jumped and then I had to turn away. Mostly I kept thinking I wish Brant would stop stepping all over Skyler. Towards the end, when the folks started talking, I leaned to my wife's car. And Carol says, I just want to know why. A woman comes up and introduces herself. And I heard someone say, Mike is starting to cry. So I restrained myself, said my goodbyes and drove away, and I haven't been back there since. The last time I saw Skyler was at my mom's funeral. I walked up the steps. Skyler ran over to me and hugged me so hard. She put a kink in my neck. My daughter Sarah was going on and on how pretty Skyler was and even took a picture of her and shows me I poked fun at her and remember her smiling at me when I did. She was always thoughtful to me and to everyone else. I never heard a mean word against her. My niece is a kind soul, smart and funny, and she touched my life for the better. This is a tragedy. It's merciless and never should have happened, I hope, in doing this for her. It shows you all just how much she means to me. I also would like to point out here today, I know in my heart, Skylar fought that night for her life, and now she's gone. Your Honor, I'm here today to fight for her as hard as she did to stay alive. The admitted murder sitting here today has nothing but blatant disregard for human life and deserves the maximum sentence for her role, and I quote, this extremely horrific and vile crime she committed on my niece. All the lies Michelle gave the family authorities and the community has me thinking she's lifeless inside with no regret other than getting caught. All the tweets, going to school, tanning beds at church camp. And let's not forget the Facebook statements should be truth enough to see right through her. She may have admitted to murder, but at what cost, Your Honor? Showing no emotion or care in the world for six months. Should be dealt with with no compassion towards her because she never gave Skylar one ounce of mercy. All the families here are ruined because of her actions. Life for life is what I read in the Bible. And simply put, she deserves no free life. Her parents couldn't reach her for some reason. And I know my family has suffered the loss of a daughter, cousin, friend, and a niece. Not to mention she'll never be able to experience being a wife, a mother, or a grandmother. Your Honor, this is solely your decision, and I will respect it. However, 
Ms. Shove getting a plea agreement just to protect herself, then I plead with you here today. 40 years, sir, the maximum by law for second degree murder, reminding everyone here this was premeditated. It should have never been given a second degree on this act. Murder is murder. The life she, for the life she stolen from Skyler, she owes my niece hers. Believe me, sir, when I tell you Skyler is with us today, in our hearts, watching over us, she'll be with my, me the rest of my life. And as for the defendant, those given to harming others bear within themselves the seeds of their own destruction. Thank you very much. Sir. Ms. Ashton. Actually, before you start, uh, let's take care of the issue of restitution Please. so that I don't have to come back to that. Uh, as I indicated, I noticed that there was filed on February the 5th, 2014, a victim impact documentation for restitution uh, by the state that reflects that the West Virginia Crime Victims Fund has paid $921.71 for counseling services for Mr. and Mrs. Neese, and also attached was a bill from the funeral home uh, for funeral expenses in the amount of $7,262.22. And it wasn't, it's not, apparently that's not been reimbursed or paid, is, it was the impression I got. It has not yet. There is that process that is going on. We okay. expect a, a victim fund to pay for that, but in the meantime, the $7,000 and some is due and owing to the McCullough Funeral Home. Yeah. So they are expenses that have been incurred. Uh, Mr. Angotti, I note that uh, a copy of that was sent to you also on February the 5th. Do you have anything that you wish to offer with regard to the issue of restitution in this matter? Uh, no, Your Honor. All right. Very well. Um, Get that out of the way so that we don't have to address it further later. Okay, Ms. Ashton, you may Thank proceed. You Skylar Neese disappeared on July 5th, 2012. This is what Rachel Schoff finally told police on January 3rd, 2012, 2013. And this is information from the documentation of her statement to police on that day. She said, we stabbed her, referring to herself and Sheila Eddy, stabbing Skylar Neese. They killed Skylar because the girls always fought with Skylar and she was, quote, in the way of the friendship between Rachel and Sheila. In the spring of 2012, Sheila and Rachel first joked about killing Skylar during science class when one of them said, we should kill her. And they looked at each other with a sense of agreement on that statement. Sheila and Skylar according to Rachel Show, always fought and the animosity between Skylar or towards Skylar intensified after Skylar accompanied Sheila to a beach vacation that summer. And we know from facts that such a vacation did occur. On July 5th, 2012, Sheila and Rachel agreed that it's today Today was when they should commit the murder. Since springtime, the girls had several conversations about killing Skylar, and it was agreed that the murder should occur before Rachel left for church summer camp. The night was agreed upon because 
Schuyler was working that night and into the evening and into the later evening and she would be able to sneak out of her home easily after she had left work for the night. Over the month before the murder, Sheila and Rachel had planned some of the details and concluded that they needed to buy knives, get a shovel, and go to Brave, Pennsylvania where this murder would occur. So on July 5th, Rachel Schoff took a shovel from her father's home. Sheila Eddy brought two knives that belonged to her mother. And they waited outside Schuyler's home. They drove to her apartment that night. They called to say they were waiting for her. And she came out and met them, got into their car. Skyler was under the impression that the three girls were just going to drive around, uh, maybe drive up to Brave, Pennsylvania, where they had been on other occasions and smoked some marijuana. So she had brought along a bong with her and Rachel Schoff had brought along some other smoking pipe. When they arrived there at that location in the countryside, the three girls got out of the car and were out of the car for some moments when at the agreed upon signal of a countdown, one, two, three, Rachel Schoff and Sheila Eddy attacked Skylar Niece and stabbed her to death. Skylar attempted to run away, but Rachel Schoff tackled her. She told police. Rachel Schoff described the scene as having lots of blood and it was never cleaned up. Following the attack and blood remained on the gravel road, Rachel Schoff estimated that Skyler was stabbed ten times before she died and she explained that during the attack Skyler's niece, ne Skyler niece's neck made weird sounds and they both continued to stab her until those noises stopped. At the time of the murder Skyler, Skyler was dressed in a yellow tie-dye shirt and green shorts she had taken a purse with her that was left in the car. They threw that purse away. They thought Skylar's cell phone would remain where her body was left. And in fact, it was found there, Your Honor. That day before taking Skylar in the dark of night, or through that evening, Rachel and Sheila drove around Star City and in the area, preparing themselves. They had concealed knives on their bodies that had been wrapped in towels by Sheila Eddy. And they took that shovel with them. And they arrived at Skylar's home and told her they were waiting for her they were waiting to kill her. Your Honor, this heartrending case has consumed us from the date we became aware of Rachel Schoff's disclosure to police. The disclosure that she and Sheila Eddy had deliberately, intentionally, and premeditatedly murdered Skylar Niece according to a plan by which they had armed themselves with knives had prepared to conceal Schuyler's body after killing her and had taken materials and extra clothing to clean up. We struggled first to accept the reality and then for months we spent hours, days and weeks trying to ensure that the cases of Rachel Schoff and Sheila Eddy could both be set on a course to accomplish as much justice as possible.
since that time, people, reporters, <coughs> have asked, well, what lessons can we learn from this? What, what, what have you learned from this crime? And I have to say, I'm, I'm baffled. Uh, but maybe one lesson is that the evil of which humans are capable passes understanding and seems boundless. Maybe another one is that if this kind of crime can happen in this relatively small and cohesive community, it can happen anywhere. But these are not lessons that help me or anyone else because I see no lesson here that tells us how to predict and prevent these heartless deeds. So as to why we're here today for the sentencing of Rachel Shope, who participated in and committed such senseless evil, I only know how to speak as a law enforcement official and to ask for justice and for the lawful penalty to be imposed. We've heard and we're asked to believe that Rachel Shope has accepted full responsibility for the crime, that she solved the disappearance of Skylar Niece, that she's not the monster portrayed by the evidence. We're asked to believe that Rachel Show finally became <coughs> overwhelmed with guilt and remorse and freely confessed her crime, that Rachel Show is a sort of hero in that regard, not really, Your Honor, you know this case, not really. In exchange for her statement on January 3rd, 2012, or 2013, Rachel Schoff extracted a benefit in the form of a lesser plea. Let's not forget that the history of the investigation is that the two defendants were questioned by police repeatedly over a period of five and six months following Schuyler's disappearance. Let's not forget that they lied repeatedly and that they were communicating with each other to keep their lies straight, to keep them consistent with each other. Here's a list of when Rachel Schoff lied to police. July 19th, 2012. September 11th, 2012. November 6th, 2012. November 30th, 2012 but it was the November 30th, 2012 interview when her nerves began to fray, her lies began to fragment, and the stories about when and where the defendants had last seen Skylar Niece began to fall apart. It was that November 30th, 2012 interview when Rachel Schoff <coughs> changed her lie a little bit. She added something and Sheila Eddy's lie didn't catch up with Rachel's lie until December 1st, the next day. <clears throat> That's when Rachel Schoff began to understand how she needed to and how she might be able to reduce her exposure. That's when she came in from the cold alone and first. That's when she confessed for a price. She sold her confession to police for the ultimate bargain of her plea to second degree murder in West Virginia. That's what happens to solve some criminal cases. And to the extent that Rachel Schoff's confession, for which she extracted this benefit, assisted the investigation, she has been compensated by the agreement for her plea to second degree murder and therewith her sentence of substantially less than a life term. That is her reward and it is more than sufficient. It is often said that children should not die before parents, that it is not the normal and proper cycle of life and death. But parents do lose children, tragically to illness, to accident, to negligence, even murder. Murder by a stranger is a horror, but deliberate murder by friends is unthinkable. It must be unbearable for Dave and Mary Nice to contemplate the fact that Skylar's friends hated her so much 
that they took her in the dark of night and stabbed her to death even as she struggled for life. They were single-minded and relentless. When we go through troubled times, we may wake up on a morning that seems new and trouble-free for the few moments until the trouble comes back to our minds. I imagine that Dave and Mary Niece wake up some mornings and that there are an easy few minutes until the fact of Schuyler's murder comes rushing back and the unbearable must be born again and again for the rest of their lives. Surely, no lesser sentence than those years of imprisonment available for second-degree murder is sufficient for justice here today. Surely, for this oh-so-adult crime of cold-blooded, planned, premeditated murder, there is no proper sentence other than an adult sentence. Surely, a sentence as a juvenile is unthinkable. If Rachel Shove has accepted full responsibility for her crime, she should not be asking to be sentenced as a juvenile. She should be willing to accept every day, every hour, and every minute of a proper adult sentence. Your Honor, you know this case. You know what a proper sentence would be. We ask that you impose that adult sentence. Just so the record is clear, Ms. Ashdown, does the state stand side behind the recommendation made in paragraph three of the plea agreement? It is a recommendation, Your Honor, and it is part of the plea agreement. Okay. Just wanted to make sure that we weren't violating the plea agreement. Mr. Van Gotti, Mr. Strathus, anything further? Yes, very briefly, Your Honor, as you just pointed out, I didn't hear Ms. Ashdown state prior to that. We were here last May the 1st, 2013, and the plea agreement that was entered into that date was with the defendant, the state of West Virginia, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, uh, consented to it, the federal authorities consented to it, and the victim's family was here, and they con consented to it at that time. The thrust of that plea agreement was that Rachel Shove would and did plead guilty to second-degree murder, that the state of West Virginia would recommend a sentence of 20 years, and that at this point we would have the opportunity to ask the court that she be sentenced as a juvenile. So nothing that was stated by us today is different than what was agreed to back on May the 1st of last year. And I believe the state, as you pointed out, uh, recommended at 20 years and they are still recommending that today, and we will simply ask the court to follow that recommendation at this time. And nothing that we can say, nothing we can do can make this matter go away, make it change, make it better. The only thing we're here today to do is ask this court to enter a sentence that was consistent with the plea agreement that was entered into based upon the actions of Rachel Schiff prior to that date, including her cooperation. Thank you. Rachel Schiff, would you please stand? There are several issues that the court needs to address that are a part of sentencing in this matter, so things may not be done in what might be considered a normal sequence of events. As has been pointed out, there is a plea agreement, and that is an agreement between the state of West Virginia and the defendant and her counsel. That plea agreement contains the recommendations of the state with respect to sentence, and it also reserves to the defendant the right to make recommendations with regard to sentence, including sentence as a juvenile. At the time this plea was entered, uh, this plea agreement was reviewed, 
and all parties were aware that the plea agreement and the recommendations contained in the plea agreement were that, recommendations that were not binding upon the court because the plea was not offered as a binding plea. With that understanding, uh, the court addresses the issues that have been raised. The first issue, the defendants reserve the right to make a sentence recommendation requesting that the court sentence the defendant as a juvenile pursuant to West Virginia Code section 49-5-13E and or any other form of alternative sentence. I've not heard any request for any other form of, of alternative sentence, so I have no intention of addressing that. With respect to the request that the defendant be sentenced as a juvenile, the court understands that a juvenile transferred to adult jurisdiction uh, does retain, I guess, if you will, the right to be considered for sentence as a juvenile. That is a determination that is left to the discretion of the court. That request has been made, that request is denied. This case was transferred from juvenile jurisdiction to adult jurisdiction, one, because it was mandated by law because of the offense committed by the juvenile. Under those circumstances, the court can conceive of no rationale under which it would be appropriate to then sentence a juvenile transferred under those circumstances as a juvenile, recognizing that to sentence the defendant as a juvenile would limit the court's jurisdiction over the defendant until her 21st birthday. Um, that would by no measure be justice in this case. Accordingly, it is the court's intention uh, to sentence the defendant as an adult as contemplated by the plea agreement. Consistent with that, Rachel Shove, for your conviction of the offense of murder in the second degree, the felony charged in the prosecutor's information in this case, it is a sentence of the court that you be imprisoned in the West Virginia State Penitentiary for a period of 30 years. The court assesses court costs as required by law, would order that you pay restitution in the amount of $921.71 to the West Virginia Crime Victims Fund and in the amount of $7,262.22 to whoever ultimately assumes responsibility for that obligation, be it either the funeral home or the Crime Victims Fund in West Virginia or Pennsylvania or whoever. You will be jointly and severally liable for that obligation uh, with your co-defendant, Sheila Eddy, although I don't recall addressing the issue of restitution at her sentencing hearing, so that will need to be addressed either by an agreed order or in a separate hearing, and you can take care of that at any time in the future. Your Honor, just so you know, I have discussed that with Mr. Benninger, and we will enter an agreed order. We will offer that to the court um, Very well. in conjunction with this hearing. Very well. I did not expect that it would be an issue. I would further order the defendant and Ms. Chove pay a one-time $10 fee to the Montague County Victim Witness Assistance Program consistent with the provisions in the code. The defendant has received the benefit of her bargain, and that was a plea to a lesser offense of murder in the second degree, an agreement by the federal authorities not to prosecute her federally, which is, I understand the law, they have every right to do even and in spite of the pleas that were entered here, and the agreement of the authorities in the state of Pennsylvania not to prosecute her there even though, as I understand the law, they have every right to do so. One other issue that I suppose needs to be addressed at this time, uh, since the defendant is still a juvenile, and um, she will remain in a juvenile facility 
and a hearing will be scheduled prior to her 18th birthday so that a determination can be made as required by law whether she will remain in a juvenile facility past her 18th birthday or we will be transferred to an adult facility. Uh, so I'll leave it to the parties to ensure that that hearing is scheduled. My guess is the juvenile facility will be contacting us to ensure that it is scheduled prior to Ms. Schoff's 18th birthday. We will address issues relating to Ms. Schoff's placement in an adult facility at an appropriate time and what measures will need to be addressed by the Department of Corrections to ensure her safety once placed in such a facility. Uh, at this point, I'm not aware of a DOC facility for the placement of uh, adult females other than Lakin. And I'm not aware of how that facility is structured with regard to the ability to segregate inmates. And those are issues that we will have to address at a future date. I'm not going to attempt to address it now. Hopefully by then I'll have a lot more information with regard to what the facilities are there. <coughs> Looking at my notes. A wise man once told me that sentencing hearings are not the place for speeches or sermons. It is not my place to understand or to explain. I understand that nothing that I have done or can do will make what has happened right for anybody. It is what it is. And as far as I'm concerned, this matter is concluded. Can I remain seated, please?